I pretty much lived, you know, up underneath my grandparents. Mi abuelita Petra, which was my mom's mom, she was like a second mother to us. My mother has always been strong. She was such an extraordinary woman. More protective than my mom, because my mom had me when she was 18, so she was really a kid. But my mom was very, very stern. I lived with them, you know, while she was going to classes and staying with them. My grandmother's the one that stepped in and helped my mom with everything. I mean, we always had an extended hand. In her own way, she was preparing me for my life. There was a lot of love and patience, but also direction. Everything was centered around my mother and my grandmother in my life. So I love Sufi poetry, you know, stuff like uh, Rumi, Hafez, Ibn Arabi. And in Sufi poetry, the rose is often a symbol, a symbol of, of God. And kind of similar to in more mainstream society, you know, the rose is a symbol of love. Different colors mean different types of love. Well. And, and Sufism, it is really the representation of God's love. Um, and who knows love more than grandmas? Um, and so it is that sort of closeness to divine love, the closest thing um, that encompasses all those different types of love that I see as um, grandma love. And I know for myself, Whenever I need that kind of love, that kind of acceptance, that kind of embrace and that kind of energy, you know, I go to see my granny um, up until, you know, she died. I still don't understand it. It's still because um, we don't know exactly what she knew. Still, there's still that unknown, which is mom you know, from her childhood to the time she passed. She didn't want anybody to worry about her. So that's why she kept, she didn't tell anybody, you know, what was really going on with her. And so when I left there in April, the April before she died, Jordan, I'll never forget, I was getting ready to go out the door to, to catch the plane. And she looked at me, and this was so sincere. And it, it just, it was, it like, something went through to my heart. She looked at me and she said, baby, I sure hate to see you go. When she died, it felt like, almost like there was this be big, beautiful rose garden in the center of my city. 
that I passed by every day that was just always there, you know, from before I was born. And when she died, it felt like that rose garden had just been scorched to the ground, you know? Um, and there's nothing there, nothing left, but just open air, uh, just a void. And after a while, you start to realize, like, all the things that you sort of associated with and, and you look to that, to that rose garden for. So I, I really yearned for that, that, that interaction with, with the grandma um, and for that kind of energy, for that kind of love. Um, and so I started interviewing grandmas and asking them about their lives and just sitting with them and talking with them. My name is Louise Wilder. I live in Galesburg, Illinois. She named me Wendell Regetta. My name is Rosalinda Argetta. I live in Franklin Park. Julie Christine Brown Houston. Uh, my name is Geraldine Watts. My name is Rena Annetta Jordan, formerly Wines. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. My name is Emma Garcia Ortega. Um, I'm 81 years young. When I interviewed the grandmas, started having those conversations with them, I really just wanted to learn sort of like about their life experience, not just as grandmas, but as, as human beings, as women, as women of color. Um, because I think we oftentimes only see our grandmas from that experience of a grandchild, which is like, well, this lady is a grandma and she's always been a grandma, you know, and, and don't necessarily think about that she had a whole lot of life before she was a grandma. Um, and, and so I wanted to sort of have that kind of conversation um, because I think a lot of us don't necessarily, you know, take into consideration or really understand the full scope of, of their grandmother experience. Um, and I think for a lot of people, when we think of our grandmas, especially black grandmas, um, we, the image that is conjured up is this caricature of, of the mammy, right? the black mammy figure. This is uh, something that was made up. Uh, it's a figment of really white folks' imagination, but um, this is that woman that you see in films like Gone with the Wind or Imitation of Life, uh, who is playing the role of the maid. She is also playing the role of the you know caretaker of the children, um, the cook, uh, the therapist, and she's just always there giving that nurturing love and care for this white family. Oh, that rests me all over. <laughs> it don't seem right for you to be carrying around them old heavy cans of syrup peddling. Well, I gotta make a living. With your pretty face and them pretty foots, why, well, you ought to have a man taking care of you, honey. Oh, Delilah. <laughs> yes, um. And so these women were desexualized and, and uh, they were... Um, not portrayed as intellectuals or as someone that be resistant and take actions of resistance against their own oppression. A lot of that imagery, I think, s still exists today in the, in the portrayal of Black women, but also I think in sort of our own minds and our own culture in terms of how we look at the role of the grandma. And so that's that was the focus of the conversation, um, the conversations that I had when I started interviewing these grandmas. In the black community, the grandmother is always there. And whether you call her Nana, whether you call her Mima, you know, Grandma, Grant, whatever you want to call it, she's always one of the forces. It seems like grandmas can cook better than anybody else, okay? They can give the best hugs. And whether you're a girl or a boy, you know, if you, if you were blessed enough to have a grandmother alive, you, were, you probably thought you were the apple of her eye. The grandbabies, those precious little faces, they come to me and talk, and I can listen to them. We can talk about what's really going on, and I don't, oh, do tell. And we have a trust, and we have a bond. That's something I didn't have with my kids. So your grandchildren, for me, is your redemption to correct what you didn't do with their parents. 
and you can spoil them till times get better, but you can send them back to your, their parents. So you, you kind of developed that sense of I'm um, the grandmother, I'm going to spoil, and I do. I, I spoil. When they're here, they can do whatever they want. I, they can eat what, even though the parents, you know, they can. I don't care. They're in my house. They can do whatever they want. And they do. And they have fun. And I want them to say, you know, I want to go to grandma's because it's so much fun. The grandmother's there. The grandmother's always there. It's, it's someone that, that if you teach them from when they're little, until I'll always be here. You'll never do anything wrong. Come and talk to me about it. We'll discuss it. I would tell everyone that a grandmother, she's so special with love. You get so much love from that lady in your life, your grandmother. She's precious. She's always with you. She always understand things and she'll explain things to you and she'll tell you when you're right or wrong. Wisdom, wisdom. Uh, the grandmother has been there, the mother has not. And there's so much a grandmother can do for a grandchild that they are never, never forget. And the mother can't do it because she's in that spot trying to teach. To walk in honesty, to be honest, to be grateful, to be compassionate. You know, as, as women, you know, teach them to respect themselves and, um, you know, just have fun with them, you know, when, when we're around and listen to them. I want to be the best that I could possibly be for them at all times. They hurt. When they hurt, I hurt more for them than I did with my own kids. Can you believe that? And the grandma's always there with hugs. Grandma's always that security blanket, or she should be. Unfortunately, right now, there's so many children being raised by grandparents, more and more. You know, and, and it's good for a grandmother to play a part in grandchildren's lives because it's things that they'll never forget. You know, I, I, I don't want to take care of any grandchildren, but I want to be their father. My responsibility is to love my grandchildren with all my heart. They are an extension of me. Uh, the only thing that I regret is that I'm not able to spend the time with them that I would like to spend with them. That's it. Sierra is an exception. She's here with me. So the only thing I can do is give phone calls, um, have them come out here. You know, uh, I try to go home as much as I can. But with my job, it's, it's kind of hard. And money-wise, it's kind of hard. But I do keep in contact with them. And I just think that they just need to know that even though I'm all these miles away from them, I'm their grandmother and I do love them. And I adore them, all of them. You know, I talk to my little grandson who's just turned 15 and I tell him, don't be out stealing. Don't go here, there. If you need anything, get on the phone, call me, call Marla. He'll call me on the phone, and I think I'm getting through because he'll call and say, Grandma, I'm at Wendy's. Can I? Can you bring me some money uh, to get me some food? I'll be, I jump in my car and I run right out there. And, and that's just not rare. It's all the time. He calls Grandma, I need a ride. I take him up to Rock Island to a ball game because I want him to realize there are good things out there. One morning, it was a Friday morning, we were going out. Uh, when he was getting ready to go to school, we were going getting in, into the car, and the trash men came by, and he picked up the the trash can and emptied it. That, and I'm like, "Did you see that happen?" He said, "Yeah, I want to do that when I grow up." And me, I saw it as a, a dirty job. I said, "But I didn't tell him it was a dirty job." I said, 
That's a hard job. He said, yeah, but it keeps Mother Earth clean. What a lesson. Grandparents is just the best thing that if you're blessed enough to have a grandmother, you know, like we had, then it made you, made you a better person, I'm sure. My granny was a force, man. She was powerful. She was beautiful. Um, she was in many ways sort of like a typical black grandma. She ran shit. Um, she was very independent, um, very strong-minded. She was the type of woman that um, always fought for what she believed in and was extremely, extremely charming. Uh, she, you know, convinced um, a white banker to, you know, give his first home loan to a black family um, after, you know, they had been denied uh, by all the, all the banks in town. They had to go out of town uh, to be able to get the home loan, to build their home, because nobody would give a home loan to a black family. Um, and so it was through her wit and charm that she convinced that banker to give his first home loan to, to a black family. No nonsense. Straight to the point. Um, how they say it, uh, give it to me straight, no chaser. Um, she was very stolen about who she was and what she thought. And don't veer from it, you know what I mean? She put that, she just puts the rules down. And Granny was the, she, she, Granny wore the pants. And, she did it both. Papa worked all the time, so I mean, Granny was a man and a female. You know what I mean, her law, her rules were the quote unquote rules. Your Granny could paint, <laughs> repair, do home repairs. Man, uh, she did it all. Cook. You know, it was great. Like growing up as a kid, when my friends would stay over, I would wake up on the weekends. There's three or four of my friends. I'd wake up. I'd smell food, they're already up in the kitchen with mom, sitting at the table eating, you know? So everyone, that's just her, you know? Everyone loved her, so whenever friends would stay over, they would, I wouldn't have to say, you wanna go upstairs and eat, they knew, because mom and dad were so welcoming, it was like, your house, is, my house is your house. So that's the uh, mentality that mom had. That prime rib, chili, mm. rib, the rib would just boom. We should open the restaurant up. I was thrown out from the family, you know, that, like that big mama meal, you know what I mean? And one, you just be like, well, slap the shit out of the person sitting next to you, it's so good. Well, I think she enjoyed cooking when she retired. I know that she had shared with me that she would be frustrated working and that um, they would wait for her to get home from work to cook dinner. And I know she was really frustrated with that. It's like Denzel and, and Malcolm X, you know what I mean? It's just that smooth walk, you know? Granny had that, she had that it, she had that, that stuff that you can't, you can't teach, it's just in you. She's beautiful, she had really warm brown eyes, a beautiful smile. Um, yeah, she was, she was lovely. She was very, um, she had a very, um, this is a difficult thing to have is the, a gentle strength. So she was gentle and very strong as well. And so she had a lot of pride. She really didn't ask for help. She always wanted to help. She got along with everybody. You know, I had friends. All my friends loved her. You know, it was just a lot of people around. You know, our family is, uh, especially our house on 461, is always a safe haven for everyone. Not just family, but friends always knew that they could come to mom and dad. She could have been the mayor of Galesburg. For a while there, she could have been. She was, Granny was powerful. She wasn't just a mom, and she wasn't just our grandmother. She was a powerful woman. Oh yeah, she was very active in the, in the, in the civil rights movement. You know, back in the 60s, we, we marched. You know, they had marches in Galesburg. She marched in Galesburg. She, uh, she was part, of, she was on the EEOC board, which was the Equal uh, Opportunity and whatever else it was. And uh, she, she, was, she did that for, I don't know, 
five, six, maybe ten years. So that was that was a big part. Because that that organization, and she was appointed by the governor, like I said before, and so you know that was dealt with the whole state. So when there was a there was an issue with unfair un, uh, employment practices, they would step in. You know, they would file lawsuits, and you know, so that was pretty big. That was pretty important job for her. And at the same time, she was running the director of Carver Center. Carver Center was a community center for, it's like an outreach, for like outreach programs. So, you know, for kids that have it tough, you know what I mean? Somewhere for the kids to go, you know, where they ain't out in the street selling dope and fighting all the time, getting involved with the police, you know what I mean? And he had activities, Saturdays, you know, and then during through the week, you know, you can come in there and get your homework done and so on and so forth. You know, you had tutors that come in from Knox College and all that. Granny set that up. Oh, well, Mom was very involved in, in the community, especially with the Carver Center and United Way. That was big to her, you know, really getting the center uh, sort of uh, when the times were changing in the 80s. Uh, uh, she made it more progressive. You know, she was able to raise funds and really do more outreach with the Carver community because it was a local community. And then once United Way got involved and Mom became the chairman, I think it was like the regional director of United Way through the Carver Center. Like she was really able to raise money and really, really get some more social programs through the center, like child care, um, after school was really big in those days. I mean, she was really out there getting money for those programs, the social programs at the Carver Center. Um, you know that that was a person that could take care of whatever needed to be taken care of, take care of you, right? Um, and she would advocate for people um, when she felt like there was an injustice. Um, but she also was just friendly and just very loving and caring. So there's nothing I don't remember about mom. She was always there. So um, she always had a smile on her face. And, you know, she was there for everyone. She worried about more people than her, people more than herself. You know, she loved life. She loved people. Well, she probably did too much of that, you know. But that was just her, you know? You know, taking care of, you know, the people in the family. She probably didn't want to do it all the time, but she did it anyway. You know, she just did it. That's what, that was Granny, you know? She brought a lot to the table. She expected a lot. She was part of a tradition of black women who uh, labored in the domestic space um, for the betterment of their families um, to be able to make ends meet um, and to also uh, fulfill the expectations set for them by society. I saw a lot when my grandmother did the domestic work. She would work five days a week. She made four dollars a day and 14 cents coffee because the coffee was seven cents at that time. And she would get to work around nine o'clock and leave at three and four o'clock. She did a lot and I saw that. And I said, it won't be me from a little girl. I saw the ingest right there. Do you cook? wash and iron and clean. That's a lot of work. And for such little pay. And then they had the nerve to stick money. Because my grandmother would come and she would say, come here, I want to show you something. And she said, now you see that dollar that? A 50 cent or a quarter. She said, that's for me to take. She says, but why would I take 25 cents, 50 cents, or a dollar, and go to jail for the rest of my life. And she taught me about being honest. After I got out of school, I went to um, um, work several small jobs. I worked at the Kroger Company. I worked at a company called Dell Farm here, both grocery stores. And um, probably one of the best things that happened to me was that uh, 
uh, Del Farm, um, the guy there wanted me to be head cashier and the company said, no, we can't have our head cashier. And it was because I was black. And the, the manager there quit as a result of it because if I can't have the best person in my store as a head cashier uh, of my choice, then I'm not going to work this job. He quit and left, went to Arizona. After that, I quit and went to Kroger's. I worked with Jackson Public Schools for over 20 some years. I worked at Tougaloo with the Head Start program. And after I retired, I worked with Hines County Human Resource for three years. Then I worked with my church. I sing with the choir, I worked with the Sunday School, and now I'm very active with the outreach program at my church. A lot of my friends did decided not to go to college or their parents couldn't afford for them not to work full time. My parents, even though they couldn't pay for college, we had to get loans and work through college. Uh, they told me, you have a house and you have food and you have clothes. Everything else is yours, but you have that so that you can go to school up to whenever you want to go to school. If you want to go to school the rest of your life, you have a house, you have food and you have clothes. Everything else you have to work for. My first job was, they called this sitting, but I was uh, on, I called it a nurse aide. I sat with um, the, the sick. I had, yeah, I experienced racism there, thinking about it, yes. I had one sitting case where this lady actually she said, she called me a nigger. So I told her, I says, I'm not a nigger and don't you ever call me that again. And I called her daughter and I told her, but her mother had called me and I told her, I says, I'm leaving. I says, I'll stay until you get here. But when you get here, I'm off the case. I don't want it. So that was one ex bad experience. I was a kitchen beautician. And I just, you know, I just didn't think that that job would allow me to support my family because people, they'll come to you one week and then maybe next month they'll find somebody else that'll do it cheaper. And I couldn't do that. So I kept my kitchen beautician. Of course, I had all the, you know, barbers and everything mad at me because I was taking their business. But hey, I had to survive. I had kids to take care of. And while I did that, I was waitressing. So I had many, many jobs. And they interviewed me for a position with the city of Gillsburg in um, human relations. And at that time, um, she said, you're so articulate. We'd really like to, to interview you. I interviewed and got the job. And after that, I um, went to Knox for a couple of years and took some courses there. I had taken uh, courses at Brown's Business College prior to that. And so I ended up being a human relations director for the city of Gillsburg. I knew my husband. I knew his check wasn't going to be enough. And I always wanted my own money. So I knew if I worked hard in school, and was able to get my degree, I would be able to get a job where I could help him, plus have my own money where I could do what I wanted to do. What my goal was to open up um, the, for people to know about black folks and what some of the things that we had done um, in, in, communities all over the United States. And so I tried to do programming so that people would know and try to people, I made myself busy with managers of companies like Butler Manufacturing, Gale Products, uh, phone company, the banks, because we didn't have minorities in those positions. And I wanted to be sure that we got a lot of people in and was successful in doing so. I hustled my whole life and I look back and I think, you know, 
if I hadn't had that will to hustle, I wonder where I would have been today. Because I felt like I had to do that because I was the only one to take care of my family. So I had to do it. I had to hustle in any way that I could. I had to hustle and get those dollars coming in. I had seen a lot of women who were sort of like prisoners to their husbands. And I didn't want to be that. I wanted to help him. I want to be the one that we got together and did things, not you tell me what to do. Um, and when I think about that history, I, I think about this mammy figure again, and I think about um, the first woman to be the face for Aunt Jemima. Uh, this was a black woman uh, by the name of Nancy Green, and she was born a slave about 30 miles outside of Lexington, Kentucky. Um, had, you know, lived her life as a slave, had married and had, had four children, all of whom were gone by the time she was in her 50s. And she ended up moving to Chicago and um, continuing to uh, serve as a domestic worker for a, a wealthy white family um, from Kentucky. Uh, that moved to Chicago, and uh, you know her employer referred her to uh, the company that had you know um, taken over the Aunt Jemima brand, and they were looking for uh, a black woman who could play uh, a slave uh, sort of housekeeper at the 1893 Chicago World Fair, where they were planning to debut Aunt Jemima's pancakes, and. You know, she was asked to uh, play the role of the slave housekeeper and flip pancakes and sing songs and tell stories about the good old days on the plantation. And uh, that's hard to swallow, to just think about having to relive and pretend that that pain wasn't there from, from being a slave. Um, but, you know, she did that for 20 years and she was the, the first official face of, of Aunt Jemima. Um, and, you know, they paid her, but it couldn't have been much because she still worked as a domestic servant for that white family the, the entire time. Um, and this woman, Nancy Green, feels close to me because my grandmother's mother, was also born 30 miles outside of Lexington, Kentucky. And she also migrated to Chicago. Um, and they had lived maybe miles apart from each other, maybe five, 10 miles apart from each other. You know, one was in Inglewood, uh, the other was in the West Loop area. Um, and they were there at the same time. And while Nancy Green was probably ending her her career as a domestic worker, um, you know, my great grandmother was probably just starting hers. And so to think about that and the fact that maybe maybe they knew each other, I don't know if they did, but, you know, two generations apart continuing to do that domestic labor, um, it just, it makes it all feel so much more real to me because I, I have a through line, you know? Um, and so it's heavy, man, and, and it's powerful. And I want to honor that tradition um, and that struggle uh, that my grandmother comes from. Um, and it wasn't just Black women. It was also Indigenous women. It was Latinx women. It was Asian American women, often relegated um, to this type of domestic work. Um, to this type of service work. Um, you know, that was the expectation and the limitation of the kind of work that um, they were pushed into and that, that they were given opportunities to do. But at the same time, there's always been women who've, you know, broken those, those glass ceilings, if you will, 
um, who've been able to do other types of work. Some of it, you know, known as men's work. Some of it um, not ever dreamed of. We have so much symbolic weight, right, that, that sort of shrouds us and kind of covers us in our experiences. And so whatever opportunities that we take to move beyond these boundaries of, you know, being a mother, being a kind of caregiver, as you kind of mentioned as we were talking about the grandmothers, it's really difficult for the Black community and society as a whole to kind of uh, fit independently you know, wealthy or kind of uh, independent women, single women into their narrative who don't uh, fit this kind of mold of, of the family that we, that we maybe want to see. So while a lot of women were doing that domestic labor, that service labor, um, there were women that were White House correspondents at that time. You know, they were boxing trainers. They were social workers and activists. Um, a lot of uh, women of color who were able to attain an education uh, were, were, went into working in the community as nurses or as teachers. Um, and so there's always been these barrier breakers um, and, and even women that were you know, entrepreneurs early on. Um, but for women like my grandmother who you know, had, I think a sixth grade education, um, those opportunities were limited. When I came across that thing, when she came to pick me up at the airport, Jordan, it was all I could do to keep a shocked look off of my face when I looked at my mom because she had lost so much weight. Her clothes were just hanging. Her face looked drawn. And I, oh my God, I got in my room and I just cried. I, I can't leave here just yet. Someone found x-rays in October around the house somewhere that shows something on her lung. Every time we would ask her about it, she would deny, I'm fine, I'm fine. Granny would always downplay anything in regards to her health. Even when she had the stints put in, um, she would deny it. I didn't have it. I didn't have a heart attack. She would deny it and downplay everything. You know, she didn't make herself too vulnerable, which, you know, maybe was not always a good thing, but I think she'd try to just be strong just from how she grew up, so. Again, we didn't know what was going on. I mean, all of a sudden, it's just like she just had been losing all this weight, which we thought was just stress from taking care of her older sister and, and worrying about my dad um, and his illness. And I was barely making it. And then I think that affected her when I got sick. You know, I didn't tell her everything that was going on with me because I didn't want her to. <laughs> After she passed away, we were cleaning out the house and preparing to move my grandfather to Portland. And we found a, you know, just a bunch of mail and medical paperwork and we're just going through that. And I come across um, these uh, scans and I'm looking at them and I asked my cousin who, who works in the medical profession and I'm like, what is this? And she's like, it says that she, she had cancer. This here is where the cancer is in her lungs. She had lung cancer. And then it was like, damn. Did she have lung cancer? She really didn't tell us. And then when, when Boo ended up getting chemo and she saw what it did to him, I think that's when she decided, no more. No more. Because I think at the same time he was going through his cancer thing, she was too.
So I also asked the grandmas about racism and sexism. And it was very interesting um, because when I first asked them that question, a lot of them didn't have a lot to say in terms of, you know, experiencing direct racism or sexism. Um, and I'm sort of like, what do you mean? You know, you, <laughs> you were born and you grew up, you know, early on in the era of Jim Crow. So um, what, do, what do you, there has to be something, right? Um, and so, you know, some of them did share some, some incidents, but a lot of them kind of minimized the impact that it had on, on them um, in their lives. And I, I thought that was really interesting because it's so different from, say, you know, my generation or the generations ahead of me um, in terms of how we look at, you know, racism and sexism and, and other systems of oppression. But I think, and I think this is true for my grandmother too, they refuse to see themselves as, as victims of those systems. And I think because of the, um, the reality of those times, you know, you had to sort of not be ignorant of it, but not let it discourage you. Um, you had to sort of feel above those systems to be able to just continue to achieve what you wanted to achieve. The, the only times I've faced racism was I told you that time they put that burning cross on my aunt's yard. That was scary. Um, and another time was, uh, I remember going someplace and one man said to me, oh, they're having catfish. That ought to be just along your alley. And they called me a name. And I just, I mean, you, of course, being black, you always run into racism. But my whole, whole thing is just, I don't give people that power to have over me, you know? I, I, I don't get, just ignore them. And that's just, you know, you're not going to have that power after me. I look at you, give you a side eye, and then, you know, keep on stepping. At the time, discrimination was very, very obvious. Uh, they would put us in a room and forget about us. I mean, they would just put us in a corner because we didn't speak English. The teachers didn't pay any attention to us. They would just talk amongst yourselves. Again, we had friends. So talk amongst yourselves, help yourselves out. We don't care. So my parents, the second year we were here, um, they saw that. So they took us out of the public school system and they put us into a Catholic school. I would speak Spanish and so would the other kids in the area because that's the only language we knew. We didn't know any English. And so the, the teachers would get real upset with us and tell us not to speak. But we didn't know what they were saying because we didn't know English. They didn't know Spanish. So we got spanked constantly until we finally understood not to talk in Spanish. I didn't have a problem. I really didn't. And I don't know if it was because of the way, maybe there was a problem and I just didn't see it. It could have been that. But my mind was on working. And whatever I had to do, I did, you know. So as far as the discrimination and all that, I knew it was there, but I think I just put it in the back of my mind. So we worked at the County Line Bank building. And I remember one of the VPs, I'm not gonna say the name, he would always, I'd be at the copy machine making copies, and he'd always come behind me and just rub against me. Um, and just, or call me in his office and say, look at that lady over there. She's new, but you know, he'd have those, you know, those, uh, what are those called? Those binoculars, yeah. Look over, and then he'd get back, it just, he just made me super, super uncomfortable. Did it to me all the time. And I go, oh, I'm the only black person here. They're not gonna, who are they gonna believe? Me, black girl, or, and he's vice president. I usually refer, I am a part of, of, of segregation. I, I know it from childhood up. Uh, and one thing that's so vivid in my mind now, as a little girl, my mother would go to town and uh, we would go in Woolworths. 
and I love cake. And we would pass the counters where the people would be sitting. And I saw the dome cakes there in the, in the dome. And I would always holler for a piece of cake. I remember that. I would want my mama to stop, let's buy some cake, let's get some cake. She said, no, come on, come on, we can't get into that. And when I got a little older, like, oh, maybe 10 or 15, I said, when I get grown, I'm going to buy me a dome cake plate and keep me a cake on my counter. I assimilated. I, I think uh, um, my character, I, I assimilate easy. I, very easy for me to change. I, I don't have a hard time with change or anything. You could see the people, you know, they, not everybody liked that we were Mexican. You could see the com. you could hear the comments. Uh, some people just wouldn't even talk to you, but I didn't care. I was there to work. I was there to do a job. And as long as I did it well, and I was proud of it, I got my check and that's all I needed. When I was growing up, it was like the male was dominant and that the woman didn't walk beside the, the male, she walked behind him. And, and whatever he said was law. Um, but it's not like that. It's not like that. But that's, that's how, that's the society I grew up in. The male was dominant. She would take me to the zoo, but we couldn't go. Uh, they had days, one day of the week that blacks could go, as that we were called at that time, Negroes. So the Negro couldn't go to Audubon Zoo any day in the week. Of course not. So it was a Wednesday that we could go once a week. And it was just for black people, for the Negroes at that time. And I didn't like that. Galesburg didn't have, um, they didn't have equal opportunity uh, positions. I wrote the affirmative action program for the city of Galesburg, which we still have. The other uh, program we had was fair housing, and uh, we didn't have a fair housing program. I wrote the fair housing program for the city of Galesburg, and one of the reasons why I was so involved with that is I tried to buy a house uh, right off of Main Street on Arthur and was told by the man there that he would not sell me the house because he didn't want to do that to his neighbors. And I said, what do you mean you don't want to do it to your neighbors? And he said, I don't want to put a black person next to my neighbors. I'm moving to Arizona. And I said, well, why do you care? He said, well, I care about my neighbors. And I didn't get the house because of that. You know, he refused to sell it to me. So then I started busy working on um, uh, the um, fair housing ordinance. And it's still going now. So the men would come in even my cousins, and they would sit at the table and we had to wait on them. We had to bring in the food, we had to warm up last tortillas. After they ate and left, then we would sit. So that's how I treat my husband, except that now we eat together. But you know, I, I warm my everything up, I serve him, I mm, put his plate in my plate, but he's just sitting there waiting. <laughs> so we were like, uh, very much the woman is the one that does in the house. And except, of course, I've always worked outside of the home. But uh, the man is the head of the family. The man is the one that makes all the decisions. The man is the one that rules the house. Went to St. Michael's Catholic School. And we went to, in the Lander Park for our promotion, we went to Lander Park in New Braunfels to have our picnic up there big. We rode on the bus and the whole thing. We were not allowed to go swimming because we were Mexicans. You could, in New Braunfels at that time, you would still see the signs that said, no Mexicans or dogs allowed. And the signs are down but there's still a part of that superiority of the race, very obvious. I did do factory work. Now there, 
Yeah, I could kind of see the discrimination because I would notice how, you know, it was like the white girls would get a pass on if they made a mistake or something, but it was like the blacks would not get a pass, you know, and they would kind of talk down to you. So yeah, in the factory, I did see that. So many things I couldn't do, like we had to ride the bus. And uh, if you sat on the bus and it wasn't full, you could sit in the back on the two back seats. But if it was full, he would move the, the, the sign that says colored in white. He would keep moving it as long as white folk got on. And backs would either have to sit on the long back seat or stand up. That's the way it was. They segregated themselves. They, they, they didn't want to be around us. It was like we was the invisible people. And the less they saw of us, the better it was for them. When I worked for the city's human relations director, I was convinced that the testing for firefighter and policemen were, was, was um, not a good one. It was not good for minorities. And I was determined to uh, be able to um, get a hold of that test. And the only way I could get a hold of the test was to apply for the position there. And I did. So I go in and, and I decided um, that I'd go and they do the physical agility first. And so um, the man that was in charge of the police and fire commission uh, was very upset with me. He didn't want me to do this. And I thought, well, I'm just going to apply for a job here. I have a right to do that. Now, my goal was to get the test. And um, so when they had the physical agility test, I went down and I got ripped myself together. And they said, you can't go in there. Those men aren't, those men aren't dressed. And I said, oh, really? That's not my problem. That's theirs. I'm going in here to take the physical agility. And they were getting dressed. See, part of that was his mind being mindset. You know, you, women aren't going to be uh, firefighters. And we don't have a fireman now, you know, a, a woman firefighter now. If I could get out there and do the same job that a man can do, then I'm my own woman. How are you going to tell me what I can and cannot do? And I'm doing a job just like you're doing. I may not get paid what you get paid, but I'm still doing it. And sometimes I'm doing it better than you are. So who are you to tell me what I can and cannot do? Yeah, I bucked it. I bucked it. I paid for it sometime for bucking it, but I didn't care. It was worth it because I'm going to be me. And at the end of the day, Nobody's going to take care of me but me. So, no, I, I didn't agree with it, but that's, that's how I grew up. That's how I grew up. You don't question. You just do. Oh, no. Do you, do you think that's how Granny and Papa's relationship was? To an extent, yeah. I really do. You know, I don't know what to make exactly of my grandparents' relationship. It was probably typical for the time period. Um, I know that they, you know, cared about each other a lot. Um, they talked a lot. Um, there was definitely love there. Um, and I have to remember that, you know, they were together for 30 years before I came along and, 35 years before I could, can I can even remember anything. So I have no idea what the first half of the of their relationship was like. Um, but I know that they they cared about each other. Uh, I think, you know, in the later years, my grandma did a lot of the work in the relationship. She took care of most things, and she kind of waited on my grandpa. Um, you know, often, uh, and she would complain to me about it, you know, and 
you know, at the time, I'm just like, ah, you know, that's that's Papa, you know, he crazy. You just make him do it himself, you know? Um, and I would scold him for like, you know, why he asked her to go get you a soda? You can get up and go get yourself a soda. You know what I mean? But I, I can, it's hard to scold your own grandpa. And, and he was so funny that he, you know, he, he could just make me laugh and I, you know, I, I didn't go anywhere with it. Um, so, but I, but I know that she was tired. She told me, she told me she was tired and frustrated of waiting on him hand and foot. And, you know, for me it was, well, just don't do it then, you know, but it, it's much easier said than done when you've been doing it for 60 years or whatever. She met my dad at the Lake Story in Galesburg. And uh, this lady, uh, Richard Pryor's mother, gave her a pair of shorts to wear, a pair of red shorts. And that's when my dad seen her in the red shirts and says, wow, who's that pretty woman over there? And that's how they got together. <laughs> 64 years. I mean, you know, they, I was very lucky, again, you know, to have two parents who were always there. So, again, you know, they married when they were young. 64 years, every relationship's going to go through their trials and tribulations. But they, I, you know, they loved each other. They play cards and listen to jazz at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I think it was not unlike uh, many marriages of that era, people who got married in the 50s. So um, I think it was not traditional in the way that she probably always worked and not that didn't, you know, that wasn't everybody. But I think in terms of their um, their communication, I think it was not unlike, it was very much like um, other marriages. And Dad loved her, you know? He was a theory, he was a man in the 70s, you know, in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know? Very chauvinistic, you know, all men were back in those days, you know? And so, um, I'm sure he has regrets in life, you know, throughout their marriage, but they stayed strong throughout, you know, and she stood by him. You know, so that's true love. And I think Dad knew that, you know, at the end. I've been thinking a lot about the term, the idea about resilience, and I think of it as coerced tenacity, right? Like, I feel like white people don't have to triumph as much as we do. They don't have to, like, be superheroes in the same way that I think black women in particular are forced to do. I think trans folks are forced to do. Um, immigrant women in, dif in, in our different ways. We're forced to have to like be so strong because this place is so oppressive. And at the same time, what isn't seen as strength is wanting to take a break knowing myself enough to say, I need this place to stop as a strength. <laughs> like, I need you to not be oppressive. That is a strength. Not me overcoming your oppression as a strength. One of the things that wasn't on my radar uh, to ask the grandmas about was surviving violence. And it just wasn't something I didn't see it as like a focus of this film and it just wasn't on my radar to specifically ask that kind of question. But it came up anyway in almost all the interviews, um, unprompted, uh, this issue of violence that they've, that they've survived. Um, you know, gender-based violence is real. It is a, um, you know, severe source of trauma. Uh, for a lot of uh, women that have survived it, um, but I was I was really I was really shocked that the vast majority of them willingly shared that information, and 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 so I can only imagine that the ones that didn't, you know, share unprompted, uh, 
likely also had survived violence at one point in their life at, at the hands of men. Um, you know, gender-based violence is a very serious issue and it is still very prevalent. Um, but I think even more so in, in the past uh, when it was, you know, very much seen as a private family matter. Um, it was not uh, something that was, um, you know, supported. The interventions and help weren't necessarily supported uh, by any social service agencies or anything to that effect. Um, and this is, you know, just part of American history. I mean, when Europeans came over here and, and settled and um, started to create a, a form of government, they based that government off of British common law. And British common law permitted uh, husbands to, you know, beat their wives. Um, and, you know, they, they changed that and they tried to mitigate it and say, you know, you can't whip your wife uh, with anything uh, thicker than uh, the size of your thumb. Right, and that's where that phrase, the rule of thumb, comes from. Um, but that was also the law here, was that men were permitted uh, to, it was explicitly stated that men were permitted to correct the behavior of their wives um, through violence. And that existed and was normalized for a really long time, and it wasn't until the late 1800s that you know two states started to remove those laws from the books. Um, but then almost another hundred years before anything uh, was really uh, passed at the federal level to address the violence against women. Um, and so those protections, those interventions, um, those community supports um, in an institutional way just weren't there. We lived together first. I should have had some clues then that he was a cheater, but he made me feel that he was the only one that cared about me. That experience that I had with my marriage was 100% it for me. Now that I'm a little older, sometimes I say, oh, I would like to hold hands with somebody, but I'm saying it now, I'm 68 now. But back then, mm, mm My dad was a woman beater, and he beat my mother, and he beat me. And I never really quite understood why. My mom was a good woman. She stayed home all the time. My dad wasn't a good person. He had a couple kids by other women, and he ran around on my mother, and he just to give you one experience of my dad that was so horrible, when my mom left him and went to the country, because my, as I told you, my grandparents were farmers, and he, they went, went to, he, my mother went to the country, and he told me, Louise, go tell your mother, take the bus out, tell your mother I said to come on home, and I did that. But you know, being a little teenager, I, my mom was packing up to leave to go to Chicago, where her brother was, and when I saw him. Uh, saw her there, I told her what he had said, and she said, I'm not going, and Louise, don't tell him anything. I'm not gonna tell you where I'm going, but she says, I'm gonna send for you. And I said, but he told you to come home, and she says, no, I'm not gonna do that. So she left. My mother, my dad found out where she was because I told a friend my suspicions. My friend went and told my dad. My dad went to Chicago where my mother was and got her and put her in a trunk and drove her all the way from Chicago to Alabama in a trunk and took, brought her back home. And then the next morning, he got me out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning. He went in the woods and got a stick and come home and got me out of bed and beat me with a stick because he said I knew where my mother was and wouldn't tell him. And my mother kept saying she didn't know, she didn't know, she didn't know. But it didn't matter. He continued to beat me. It wasn't until I saw a documentary that the state's attorney's office made about women of domestic violence, several of whom worked for us and worked for the police department and um, everybody was turning the other way. 
when these women were talking about the violence. And so some courageous women did make a video and we all came in the room to watch the video. And it was at that point I realized that I was watching me, but I never said it was me. I mean, it was very tumultuous. It was, it was a bad situation. And what made me really wake up, which I should have woke up sooner than that, but um, one night he got dressed to go out. And uh, I, had, I was fed up. I was fed up watching him go out, knowing that he's out there cheating. So I said, well, I'm going out too. He said, no, you're not. I said, watch me. I let him get dressed. I even ironed his clothes for him, laid him out and everything. He looked up. I walked up in the club. And I mean, I was clean too. <laughs> I was clean. He's up at, over at another table with a bunch of females. Oh, they just laughing and really having fun. And then when they saw me come in the door, they were like, is that Julie? I walked right to the bar. I didn't say a word. I walked right to the bar, ordered me a drink. Here he comes. My mother finally got away and came to Galesburg. When she came to Galesburg, I wrote her a letter because my dad was treating me so bad. And I asked her, would she please come and get me? And she called me back and talked to me. And she said, Louise, I'm going to come and get you. And she, and she did. Well, the letter that I had sent to her and told her that I couldn't take what my dad was doing and that if she didn't come and get me, she'd never see me again because I couldn't live that way. She knew what that meant. So when she got there, my dad took her and beat her so bad. I mean, he beat her bad. So my mom had him arrested, and they put him in jail. And I know I'm a small person. At that time, I was 108 pounds soaking wet. How could someone six foot three, 175 to 180 pounds, justify fighting someone 108 pounds, five foot three? So yeah, the violence it, 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 that um, that had a lot to do with a lot of my decisions about remarrying remarrying and things like that. It makes me uncomfortable to this day to think that I tolerated that. And I spent a great deal asking why 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 would you why would you accept that? He said, uh, you want a drink? I said, I didn't come here with you. You can go back over there to the table with, with whoever that is over there that you're with. I came out by myself and I told you I was coming out. Make a long story short, when it was time to go, yeah, I got in the car with him to go home. We pull up in the driveway. The next thing I know, there's a gun to my side. He pulled a pistol on me. And he told me, the next time I tell you not to leave this house, you don't leave it. I said, okay. My, you know, I'm scared because Chicago, he's from Chicago. I don't know what he might do. I said, okay. Jordan, he went to sleep. When he woke up, I had the pistol pointed right at his head. And I told him, don't you ever put a pistol to my side like you're going to kill me. I bore two of your children and this is what you do to me? He was scared. He said, that gun's loaded, that gun's loaded. And it was loaded when you pulled it on me too. I waited for him to go to work the next day and he worked out of town. I waited for his check to come in the mail. I got that check, I cashed it and I never looked back. I already had me apartment set up and everything. I never looked back. Violence is real. We have a tendency to dismiss it. We say, oh yeah, girl, I, I knew I was gonna get my butt beat. You know, as women, we used to all sit up and laugh about it. But when I saw that video and I said, hey, wait a minute. Oh no, uh-uh. No one deserves that.
No one. So I grew up remembering what I had lived as a child and knew that I could never see my kids go through anything like that. So I think I was a good mother. I tried to be a good mother. My, my daughter calls me sometimes now, and the last thing she said to me a few months ago, Mom, I don't know where I'd be if it hadn't been for you. You stuck with me no matter what kind of problems I went through. You were there for me. You know what, though, Jordan? All of this that I have been through has made me such a better woman. It, it really, really has. I feel like I am. I don't take nothing from nobody. Nobody. I speak my mind um, because he never let me speak my mind. Never. I could never say anything. I speak my mind now. And I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings. I don't mean for it to hurt your feelings. But if you don't want my answer, don't ask me because I'm going to give it to you raw and uncut. Because that's how I've always had it, raw and uncut. But I think our, our harm doers need support. Because most of the folks who have done harm are survivors themselves or have witnessed forms of violence. Thus, are third-hand or second-hand survivors, and they need that shit processed out. They need that shit seriously processed. Um, because they're not super heroes either, you know? Get, and it's healing, but also healing to transform, not healing to get over, healing to be somebody different. A lot of what um, I heard in regards to the violence that these women experienced, it didn't make it into this film because violence is dramatic. And when you hear some of those stories, um, they're hard to forget. I didn't want that to be the thing that you remember most about these women. Um, I didn't want that to be, you know, sort of the legacy that this film uh, leaves for them because they don't see themselves as victims. Um, and I don't want them to be perceived as victims. Um, but I did think it was important to touch on it and hear a little bit because it is so prevalent and not talked about enough in terms of what we can do as men, um, what we can do uh, to create, you know, environmental factors uh, that, you know, reduce the likelihood of violence against women. So I think cisgendered men can support the liberation of cis, trans, women and girls of color, gender nonconforming communities, and I think There are so many ways. I think in an immediate sense. Immediately, I think it would be to learn from these communities. So be humble enough to learn from them and to be challenged by what it is that we will be saying. And not just as like uh, an intellectual and a disconnected political way, but at a deep, profound, like sit with that shit and let it impact you. I don't exactly know why she kept her cancer a secret. I have my guesses. Um, I think she didn't want to be a burden. Um, I think she was so used to being the one taking care of people that she didn't know how to be taken care of or didn't want to have people, you know, worried about her. Um, she didn't want to be a burden. She didn't want to um, be on the other side of, of that care. Um, maybe that was it. Maybe it was that she was so used to just having to be the this, this strong um, black woman figure 
that she was, that being vulnerable was too too much for her. It wasn't a, a position that she kept, felt comfortable taking. She let me sign the ROI, release of information. She let me sign all of that, knowing that she had already told that doctor, don't say nothing to her about my illness. Here, I think I'm doing something. I'm finding out all the information I need. No, I wasn't. She tried not to let it you know, bother her, but I know it did. And then when I got that call, and my father said, I'm going to put the phone up to your mom. I was on my way up to the airport to go back out there. I'm going to put the phone up to your mom's ear so you can tell her goodbye. Since I have to tell my mom goodbye, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? But it was. And I, every day I think, and I know that this is untrue, but I still want to feel like if I would have stayed, Maybe she wouldn't have died, but she would have because she was so far gone and she didn't tell us. On the other hand, I know that she wanted uh, to make sure dad was okay. I mean, that was, that became her mission in life to make sure papa was okay, you know? And so it became not about her living, it was about more of Papa surviving and getting on with the next chapter because she wanted to go out in her own way. I know I've done it and my mother has done it. We paint a picture of being invincible. We don't show pain because we were raised that don't show pain. You know, because the man is working too hard and, you know, you have to be strong for the family. So you need to learn how to suppress it and suck it up. And if you need to express yourself, you need to learn how to go somewhere to a quiet place where no one can see you and then you can express yourself. But get yourself together before you come back home. Humbly speaking, the reason why I think the stereotype and the fantasy of uh, quote unquote strong black women is that it, um, we have stereotypes of what it means to be strong. And strong tends to have very hyper-masculine qualities which is that you can triumph and be resilient and fight through everything under the sun when I think human beings shouldn't have to fight under many of the circumstances that black communities, specifically black women, um, have been forced to do. So essentially, I think the stereotype is, to, is, is, to, is a coercive one, which is you should be able to withstand all the oppression um, that the world and this country is kind of predicated upon. So it doesn't allow folks to be able to be strong in their vulnerability. And what we show our grandchildren is that we have capes on with big S's on it. Whatever they need, we could give it to them. Whatever they want to do, we're going to approve of it. Whatever they want, we're going to make sure they get it. That's what we did. That's what we do. And then when we start breaking down, the first thing that our families do is, what is wrong with Granny? Now, having spoken to so many more grandmothers and having done um, so much self-education on, on this history, you know, I can do my part to help disrupt um, the perpetuation of these of these of this exploitation of women's love and labor. Um, and as a male, as a cisgendered hetero male, having that power and privilege um, to be able to do so and to call out, you know, my peers. Um, 
and do what we can in the, with the kind of love that our grandmothers have given us, that radical love, that um, unconditional, no, it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, you know, you belong here kind of love, and we love you kind of love. If we reciprocated that, then I think we could, um, you know, release some of these struggles and create uh, better environments and more equity and more justice for women.